large whale entanglement response pre presented by Ed Lyman. Um, he's the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary's Natural Resources Management Specialist and large whale entanglement response coordinator under NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. So I think he's a little bit busy, just based off of his titles. Um, he's responded to more than uh, or he's responded more than 120 times to disentangle and free large whales and other marine animals from gear over the last 25 years, resulting in more than 50 large whales being freed, 30 of those being off of Hawaii. Ed works with NOAA fisheries, state agencies, and others to better understand the animals and to address the threats that impact them, his, uh, especially ship strikes and entanglements. His efforts encompass Alaska, the East and West Coast, Hawaii, and other countries. Ed has worked with the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary for more than 17 years. Um, so with that, please join me in welcoming Ed Lyman. Thank you, Jill. You did, you did really well. That's half the lecture right there, I think. <laughs> oh, and aloha, everyone. It's great to be here. I love doing these things and, and being able to meet people again and fill you in on something. Let's get the presentation up. Here, I'm talking already, and I end that. And I want to tell you about our large whale entanglement response, and it's definitely our large whale entanglement response. It's definitely a team effort. Indeed, I want to tell you about our large whale entanglement response. And uh, team effort, I'm going to make things clear for you. And that catchy uh, title there, that catch and release, sorry, two puns in one. Uh, yep, but catchphrases. But um, definitely want to make it clear. I want to show you a lot of video and, and audio there. Kind of try to put you there, uh, right there in the inflatable boat, trying to help these animals and gain information towards the big picture of, uh, towards prevention. And uh, I want to give you some background first before we get into how we cut the whales free. And it's everything from, uh, well, one, it's a global threat. It affects many species out there. It's not just the large whales, but the large whales are indeed impacted as well. Okay. And uh, as far as what we know about the impact, not a lot in a sense. I mean, here's the problem. They are indeed big animals, but that large size makes it very challenging to work with the animals. And they end up being very large needles in a very large haystack out there. So as far as the information side, the science side of things, it provides a disconnect in the information. They rip the gear off the ocean floor and swim off with it. And now we've got to kind of connect the dots back in time and space to figure out what they're getting caught in and what part of the gear and where it came from and things like that. Because I'm going to keep stressing this, it is indeed about prevention, about reducing that threat overall and not so much about trying to cut one whale free at a time. But the impacts are still there at the individual level and at the population level. And we still want to monitor those impacts. They're very dynamic. That's something you guys, I'm going to maybe touch upon this, but things are changing out there. I'm not going to get into in depth here on the environmental change side of things. But I want to mention that as those environmental changes occur, the animals adapt and the threats change because of those adaptations, changes in their behaviors and so on. And of course, it's not even that simple. Fishermen and us in general, we adapt, we change. And so the whole threat thing is very dynamic. So we need to continuously monitor the animals, and it's a team effort again. I wanted to stress that. Okay. okay, there's the team effort. I'm going to do this over and over again, kind of show you the different people that are part of this effort. And it's everyone from the tour boat operators, the Coast Guard, different state and federal agencies. A lot of people are involved. I also want to tell you a little bit about not just the individual impact, but the population level impact as well. I mean, we do care about the individuals, the animal welfare side of things, and we'll do our best to help that individual. But we've got to look at the big picture as well. And there's not, again, a lot of, a lot of numbers here in this regard, but I have an old one. It's up there. Um, 308,000 whales. This is dolphins, porpoises, and the great whales we know fall victim each and every year. Okay, that was, that's hard science, okay? And it's, it's very much an underestimate of the, the impact of the threat, by the way. 
Okay. Now, it's considered one of the big human causes, anthropogenic causes um, out there of, of, of fatalities of the whales, mortality. Uh, for humpback whales, I just looked this up. We're looking at around two-thirds of the reports of large whales entangled gear end up being humpback whales. This is nationwide, by the way. Okay. And then for some species, like the North Atlantic right whale, the vaquita in Baja, California, the impact of the population level is critical. It is keeping the population down. It's, it's actually causing a decline. Uh, it's, it's that major of an impact. Okay. For the humpback whales here in Hawaii to give birth and, and breed and um, nurse their young here okay, seasonally, the impact is not too critical. Okay. It's, it's there, but it's not causing a population decline, not by itself. Okay. So it's not overtly affecting the population. It, there are, again, effects. But I'm going to show you sort of the different scientists showing their population um, abundance estimates. And it's been increasing over the years, generally speaking. Now, that last estimate there I can give you is 2006. It was the last time we really went out and got a good number uh, estimate, population estimate. Uh, at this point, uh, hard to see that red line, but um, we don't know exactly where the population level is, hence the question marks there, and exactly what that impact might be today. Okay. I want to give you some numbers here. Okay. This is some background. We're going to get into how we cut a whale free. But just over the time since we've been here in Hawaii, okay, the sanctuary and, and again, everyone looking and, and logging in, over 400 reports of large whales entangled in gear, almost all of them humpback whales, by the way, 209 of them confirmed, and 100, that represents 141 different animals. So I just want to give you a, a general perspective, and then you can see the the different reports, uh, confirmed cases over the different years, generally increasing over time, and, uh, but small numbers. Again, they're big needles in a big haystack, so we don't find them all. One more way, I don't want to get too involved in the science, but one more way to get at the magnitude of the threat is we're all doing this, is you're looking at the whales, taking pictures, you know, humpback whales lift that tail up, and that peduncle, uh, the tail stock of a whale, is a catch point for entanglements. Either they, they catch it further forward and it gravitates towards the tail, or they catch the gear by the tail. So it's a good place to look for the scars left behind. And when we do that, many populations, generally speaking, around the, around the globe, for, for example, around 30 to 70%. Right whales on the East Coast, it's up to 87% of the animals have scars indicating they've been recently entangled. Remember, there is a species of population it's affecting the population. It's causing a decline or holding them steady. Okay. For our humpback whales, we've been doing the estimates here, humpback whale sanctuary. We've been getting numbers, I think it's around 14, as low as 14. Let's get you another image there. It's as low as 16, and right on up to almost 34%. Okay. Different years, different estimates. So there's your range uh, in that area, maybe 104, 105. Okay. This last season, we came up with a 17.7% percent, just crunch those numbers. Okay. Just giving you a sense, here's one thing I want to mention, though, is the more you look, the more you're going to find. So, for instance, just using the scar analysis, the more images we look at, the higher the rate goes. The more regions, the more parts of the body we look at, makes sense, nothing earth-shattering here, the higher the scar rate is. And that's a general theme overall. And for, for instance, when we first came here to Hawaii and started working with doing the large whale and tank response, many people said, ah, we don't get very many entanglements here. And certainly there were fewer back then, but people didn't know who to call, they weren't reporting, and with the greater awareness, the reports started increasing. It's, it's there. The scar rate, I didn't mention this, it shows us that uh, entanglement occurs everywhere. Okay? It's, there is no place on this earth where animals aren't getting entangled. Going to give you a not too much more background, but I thought I'd do is I always change the presentations here. No one ever gets the same presentation. I thought, I'm going to go back in time this time, give folks a, a historical perspective. So I want to do that first, and, and it will be focused on Canada and the U.S. It's going to be relatively close to home. Okay? Then I want to tell us back to our title, um, cut and, or, sorry, Catch and Release. I want to explain that. How do we cut the 40-ton whale that's 45 feet long, free swimming, out in the open ocean, doesn't know you're there to help it, how do we do that? And then give you some case histories. And what I'm going to do there is I get to show you lots of videos, show you, put you in the boat with us. 
But at the same time, I'm going to sprinkle in some of the, um, some of the accomplishments, some of the science, some of the things we're learning. I'm going to give you some more data. Okay. And at the end, accomplishments. How have we done as a team? Show you, show you some of that. Okay. First thing on the historical perspective, fishermen. They're the first disentanglers. This is from a, a child's children's book. I just, uh, it's from um, Jessica Lennon's book there. It shows a fisherman rescuing whales. Certainly, even today, they're doing it. They don't want to catch whales. Most fishermen don't want to catch them. Um, but in the early days, they were the first disentanglers. Okay? Then, and again, this is a, a focus a bit on Canada and the U.S. here, a little closer to home, John Lean and fishermen off of Newfoundland. Interesting case here, by the way, because it's happening today off of California, off the West Coast, and that is a change occurred for whatever reason. Environmental changes, food changed. Well, in Newfoundland, the humpback whales came close to shore all of a sudden, chasing capelin, a small schooling fish. And that brought them into, I think I have a picture here, yep. So I don't have to do that. Let's see if I can get this right there. Into the weir system, a trap system along shore. So suddenly, humpback whales are getting caught like all over the place. And fishermen were pulling their hair out, going, what do we do? There was this poor biologist at the local uh, um, college there, university, and they ran to him for help the guy from Iowa, and this guy in the sociology department, John Lean, started rescuing whales. And to give you a sense of the numbers here, I mean, he's rescued like 850 whales at least over his lifetime. So my numbers don't compare, okay? In one summer, and a Newfoundland summer is short, he rescued around 85 humpback whales. So again, I'm generalizing. So there's John right there. And he used, he's, a lot of his knives were on hockey sticks, being the Canadian. So he's like, pull out a different hockey stick. It's kind of cool. Okay, then we're going to go back. Well, that's in the 70s and the 80s. And it goes on. He, goes, he works through the 90s. But around in the 80s and 90s, the gear changed. It became, started getting stronger. It went from the natural lines to poly lines to poly blends. And the gear changed such that the whales could grab it, get entangled in it, and swim off with it. Okay, so the whales are now mobile. And then uh, Stormy Mayo, Dr. Stormy Mayo, and Dave Matilla come along in Cape Cod. These are the guys that taught me, so I'm going to start coming into play here. And they had to slow their whales down and get them to stay at the surface to cut them free. They weren't anchored in the gear. Okay. And by the way, with John and the fishermen, it was save the gear. It wasn't save the whale. It was all about fishermen trying to save that weir so they could keep fishing. Okay. By the time Stormy and David in the 80s and 90s come along, it's all about save the whale. It was a total 180. And here comes the shift, because by the time I come along to be the first apprentice of Stormy, Mayo, and David Matilla, and right whales started getting entangled, that species that was critically endangered, the, we figured it out. We were like, we can't save every whale. There was some video playing there. But we figured out that it had to be both. Save the gear to learn about it, save the whale to help the one animal. So it evolved over time until here we are in Hawaii, and we're doing here in Hawaii and many places throughout the globe now. So, so that's a little brief history there. I do want to tell you how we go ahead and actually catch these whales. Remember, they're likely to be mobile, not anchored in the gear. And even if they're anchored, they're mobile. Okay? So, and so again, my emphasis is, from the video here, they're typically swimming with the gear. Okay? They rip it, part of it, all of it, off the ocean floor, swim off with it. It buys them time, and as a result, buys us time. So it might seem counterintuitive. How, you know, we're going to rescue a 40-ton whale, but we can because they're not immediately impacted. Okay? We're talking months, years. I've worked on a whale that was entangled for three years before we could get the gear off of it. Okay? It's not easy. Um, it, it is dangerous. I'm going to show you a little video clip here. This is from two years ago. It's one of our Hawaii whales. Had to stand down on that one for a while. Did get it the next day, but they don't always realize you're there to help them. Okay? People have died, not locally, but we had uh, fishermen had been part of the network for 10 years in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, had cut free, I think, about a dozen whales. He got hit by one of the right whales he was working on, and it ended up killing him. So it's the first fatality in our network, our global network. Okay? But there's still value in responding. I know Joe would want this, and that is we gain a lot of information. I know that's my last bullet there, but that's the big one, towards prevention or reducing the threat. But we're also keeping people safe. There's that public safety nexus. There's the awareness side of things. That's always important, uh, outreach and education. And there is 
saving the whale. There is helping one whale at the, the animal welfare side of things, too. So there's a lot of good value here. So we're still doing it. Got my Moby Dick video clip there for you. This goes, does pretty well, because this is it. This is back, to, it is fishing. Okay, it's a, it's a form of a fishing, and whaling was a form of fishing. You, you were trying to catch the big fish. Remember Moby Dick, Herman Melville, it was a big fish. Okay, so this is the technique. Generally speaking, it can be tweaked, where you're attaching to the whale with the, in this case, a harpoon, because the harpoon was not killing the whale. They were just attaching to the whale. Once they had the whale, well, they get the Nantucket sleigh ride, as you saw. They added some barrels or kegs to the whale. They called it kegging to add drag and buoyancy. Whale would slow down, stay to the surface. They lanced the whale to death, and that's how, what killed it, bled the whale out. So we just got to take that technique and tweak it a little bit because it doesn't look good on the Channel 6 News, right, to say we're harpooning the whale to save it. So let's go through the process because in, instead of the harpoon, we've got the grapple. Here it is up in the upper left-hand corner there. So we're going to throw the grapple, grab grapple. And we brought some of the tools with us to get a hold, of, not of the whale directly, but to the gear entangling the whale. So, and we got a Nantucket sleigh ride, just what the whalers called it. Okay. I'll show you a Nantucket sleigh ride. Not smart, by the way. This could be a little testosterone, kind of get in the way of logic. But, um, <laughs> yep, because you're not going to, you know, even Arnold Schwarzenegger is not going to outmuscle the whale. So, you've got to be smart. So, what you do is don't do the Nantucket sleigh ride, add the buoys. And our buoys are not the kegs. They are this, the poly balls. They're actually the same gear that you might find on the whale, entangling the animal. So I think we're just showing a poly ball. There it is. It's being attached now. Joe's attaching it, and we're going to bide our time. So we're prepping the whale, slowing it down, going to stop it from diving. Again, they might not realize you're there to help them. And keep assessing, just like a doctor. You're like the whale doctor, trying to help the patient. Okay? And if it takes three barrels, Use three barrels. So I got Jaws in, too. I got Moby Dick. So, yep. And by the way, the look these guys have of that, like, what the heck just happened? That is very typical of whale rescue, okay? Because every whale rescue will be different, okay? Okay. So we'll at least show you that look. I, you know, it's that quizzical look, like, what the heck just happened? There you go. Okay. That's good enough. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. But once you've taken that time, maybe it's two hours, maybe it's four hours, the whale will stay near the surface, it'll go slower, you can pull up on that line that you've used and get right behind the whale. Nice thing about whales is they don't go in reverse. So that is helpful. And then you reach out and with a hook knife on the end of a pole, you can make that cut right there. You saw one cut there. I'm going to show you lots more video, by the way. Okay, here's another cut. Got to show you another one. But again, the whale's right there in front of the boat, inflatable boat. Okay, no more wooden skiffs. And there's a cut. Now, that, there was one more cut to free the whale, but there you get the sense of it. So what I want to do is I'm going to give you more case histories here. First one is going to take you back, what, 2015? It's an adult humpback whale. It's a, a female. She was first seen off the Big Island. Let's see if I can do this. Some uh, woman was out in her lanai and saw the whale here, okay, off the Big Island. And basically, we could not get to it right away. But a day or so later, kind of got partial tracks right here, it was tagged. So I'm going to introduce a piece of technology, pieces of equipment that we use. This tr transmitter package right there, there's a transmitter, put it in that buoy, attach it to the gear. We can keep track of our whale now. So we can see, in this case, that whale circumnavigating the Big Island. And we start to get a bead on its speed, and, and it gets to the north end of the Big Island. And we go, is it going to stay on the Big Island, or is it going to go to Maui? And it came to Maui. And boy, it was, by that time, we kind of had a beat on it. We, we were right there at the wind line at Molokini, like on, it should be here any minute. And it did. <laughs> yeah. So it was pretty amazing. So here we kegged it. She was mobile. And we put, the, put a couple of buoys on her, slowed her down, kept her to surface. And then here's the team in the inflatable boat right behind it. Going to show you some pole cam footage. The camera's on the poles right there with the knife. There's a cut there. She had five wraps around her tail. So there's... I think that's actually the second cut. So we've got two or three wraps off of her. Let's show you the last cut we made. Starboard side of her, there it is right there. One wrap left, but that last wrap just came unraveled. Okay, and there's a picture here I want to show you. Here's the pole, or the pole coming out of the water, but the camera's still rolling, and there's that last wrap coming undone. So she's going to be free of gear, okay? 
so successes. And then again, of course, you collect the gear. So some of that, what you're seeing up there on the screen, is some of that is our kegging buoys, and some of that is the gear off the whale. Okay, so got to figure out what it is, where it came from. I'll give you a hint. That was from Alaska. Okay, okay, and we're using drone technology. So some uh, pilot studies. Sorry, what we did a couple years ago, help us assess it. Assessment both for operations to figure out what we're going to do and what tools we're going to use to get that whale free, and assessment towards gaining the information towards reducing the threat as well. Okay, so here Christmas Day a couple years ago, I think this is two years ago, uh, Lee James, a tour boat operator, that's again they're part of the team, put his drone up and we got a good assessment of a mouth entanglement of another female humpback whale and about mouth entanglements, we have to be careful how we want to pull on them because if it's wrapped around the baleen, we don't want to pull too hard. You could rip the feeding apparatus from its mouth. But we got this, it's coming up here. I should have cropped this a little bit more, trimmed it. But um, you're going to get a view of what is just a loop of line coming out of the right side of the whale's mouth. And that tells us it's not woven in the baleen. Therefore, we can pull and maybe get lucky and just pull it from the whale's mouth and get everything off the whale. And that should be about the best. There's a the loop. You just saw it there for a second. And this whale is very hard to get up to. So this was, a, this was perfect to have and great tool. So we did keg it. And we got to a point where actually all we did was keg it. We put the third buoy on. And the third buoy, the drag, pulled the line right from the whale's mouth. So we never actually had to make a cut. Here we are pulling up and adding a buoy, by the way. So you get some of the helmet cam footage now coming into play. You've got pole cam, helmet cam. So we got three people in the boat, Nicole Davis, Lee James. And we're bending the line over the bow. And Lee, who's in the second position, is going to add a kegging buoy, clip it in. Okay. And then she's going down, by the way. So we're going to have to let go pretty quick here. Look at, she's, there goes the buoys down. So you always got to be careful you don't get pulled over. Okay. And then what happened is moments later, all the buoys popped up. We went over. We carefully grabbed. You don't go pulling it all into the boat because maybe the whale's still attached. Uh, and, uh, but you see me smelling the line because I, I saw the loop. And I'm like, is that the loop? Of course, if it smells like whale breath, we know that was it. You know? so it's, so, and it was. It was whale breath. So we knew that was all the gear from the whale's mouth. So that one's done. Okay. And there's the gear. So again, like, I like showing the people to help us and, and part of the team and the gear. So I'm going to give you another case here. This was uh, just uh, what, last year. Um, this is a juvenile male humpback whale. Had a couple hundred feet of line trailing from the mouth again. Okay, And it's just off, kind of right off the, the probably coastline here. It's a whale going down. We're Nantucket sleigh ride at this point. So, and we've just made a cut. And we're, what we're going to do here is unravel, untwist the line, and see if we can feel the line shifting in the mouth. So maybe we'll get lucky. Maybe it'll be another case where we can pull it from the whale's mouth. If we feel no shifting, you can only trim. So these Nantucket Slay rides are valuable. We can tell what's happening. Okay. I'm going to keep going because it shifts. I can feel it shifting. Good sign. Okay. Let's keep going. Because this whale, after a while, did not became kind of a uncooperative, I'll say. And we had to stand down for the day. Okay, so some of the drone footage capturing the effort there. Um, started swishing the tail and then slashing the tail and breaching. So we stood down, but we had the tag on it. Remember, we have that telemetry tag. So we go back the next day. Whale's totally laid back. Just sit, I'm going to show you a cool video clip. And we actually thought, let's not pull on it this time. Maybe she's learned. Maybe we've learned. We, got, we just kind of pulled up above her and just pulled it from her mouth. She was oriented up a little bit, and she just opened her mouth, and we just pulled it right out of the mouth the last little bit. So it was really cool. And there it goes. And she's breaching afterwards. So it was kind of a cool thing. Yep. So success. That's, that's the entangled whale. It was the entangled whale there. So, so we're still learning. That's the message there. Then this year, we had a couple this year. This is one of them. Another subadult, I believe. Yep, it says subadult. Okay, another, mm, this is a mouth entanglement as well. Yep. And Coast Guard helped us on this one. We had a two-prong attack. Coast Guard station, uh, the 45 out of Malai Harbor, went out first, and we got the working line on and did some assessment, and then the rest of the team was able to show up. So they established that line, and let's keep going here. 
got the Nantucket slave right. This whale did take us into the wind line, so things were getting a little rough for us. Okay, and here's the, oh, I could have turned the volume down on that one, couldn't I? The helmet cam footage of the inflatable. So we're pulling ourselves up, trying to get closer to that whale over time. Okay, and I will keep going here. And here we are right, getting kind of behind her. Okay, or behind him, I think, in this case. Okay, I got uh, Grant Thompson and Dr. Mark Lammers is in the boat with me in this case. Um, and I think Mark is going to get on my shoulder and actually make the first cut, because it's a bridle, remember a mouth entanglement. Same thing, cut one, and see if it'll shift. See if we can pull it out of the whale's mouth. So right here, Mark is cutting one line. We untwist it, we pull nothing. Even with the rough sea state, there was no budge. So probably it was embedded in the back of the mouth. And there, we don't want to pull too hard. So we trimmed, so we had to make another cut. And let's pull up again. It's getting a little rough. I don't want to make people seasick, but well, here's the untwisting part. So let's, there's a lot of untwisting. We'll keep going. Okay. And then here we are pulling up. Coast Guard is now a support boat, by the way, safety first. And here we are trying to make some cuts. That's about when the helmet cam dies. Yep, that's the end of the helmet cam in that case. So the end of the footage. But we got the last cut and left a little bit in the whale's mouth. Now, both those cases, uh, actually those last three cases, the gear came from high latitudes, came from the whale's feeding grounds, okay? Either Alaska or British Columbia is the primary feeding grounds for the Hawaii population. Okay, all those red arrows are, are real data points, okay, where they've come from. Sometimes I know specifically, sometimes it's just a regional thing, okay? okay. Uh, by the way, the whites are where it's the other way around, from Hawaii up to the feeding grounds, okay? And then gear types, uh, generally speaking, it's everything and anything, okay? Just give you a little bit of science here. Uh, but most of it's fixed gear, gear that's set and left, and most of it is fishing gear. About 75%, as far as we can tell, is fishing gear, okay? But there's, most of it's out there is fishing gear. And the gear that's, well, fishing gear is also fixed gear. So it's like, cra it's, it's traps or pots, a uh, long line. Um, Things of that nature, things that are left and, and set, not mobile fishing gear, okay? Uh, let's tell you some more here. Oh, and I wanted to go back and introduce that change thing. And I don't have time to get you too much detail on whole environmental change, but I want to at least introduce three big environmental changes that we experienced a couple years ago that kind of was the perfect storm. They kind of peaked at the same time, and that was a major El Nino. It was the blob, that high latitude, very, well, high latitude warm water cell of the uh, West Coast and, and Alaska, British Columbia, and then the, a very much longer term uh, cool warm cycle um, is the North Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And they all kind of peaked around, well, between 13 and 2015, 16 year time frame. Let me show you this, because I'm going to show you some data. There's a Hawaii there, there's the number of reports over time for like the last decade. There's Alaska coming into play. See some cycles going on, okay? And they match up pretty well with some environmental cycles like El Nino's and things like that. And then let's show West Coast. Okay, boom, numbers really changed on the West Coast of the US. They spiked way much higher than the average had been over the years. And then BC, didn't have all the data, but some spike, a little spike there as well, and some higher numbers for British Columbia. And then there's the, that vertical line is about the peak of the environmental change. So you can see some of the peaks lining up on the entanglement side, the reporting side there. And then I can take it back, um, back to where the changes started to occur, environmental changes started to occur, that lighter vertical line. Okay, I know I'm going fast there, and I probably should skip this one, but I, what I'm trying to do is just look, give you part of the cycles, part of the changes in, in our entanglement reporting, and overlay some of those environmental factors there and show you, generally speaking, pretty good fit that environmental changes affect threats. It's just an example of that, and we see that in the reporting. Even small numbers that we have might actually show that trend, that correlation. I probably should keep going. Let me give you some examples, though. Sometimes graphs like that don't do it justice, because what I want to do here is show you that, boy, the reports had been kind of high in Alaska and low in British Columbia, but when that change occurred, British Columbia reports spiked, and Alaska reports generally went lower, generally, okay? 
And we get whales from both areas. Lo and behold, we started getting a lot more entanglements from British Columbia. I mean, not, nothing earth shattering, but a nice little linkage between there with the change. Okay, so that vertical line is when the change occurred. And then um, I'm gonna give you some more case histories because this is, this, is, uh, this past season, a humpback whale we had that carried an entire Dungeness crab pot from British Columbia. First time we've had the whole trap. We get pieces of line, parts of the gear, maybe parts of the trap, but when we looked in the water behind this whale, about 100 feet down was this commercial crab pot about this big dragging below behind the whale. So, but we got some of the gear off this way. We didn't get it all, but this, I wanted to show you. We didn't, again, we, we're not always 100% successful, but in this case, even though we didn't get all the gear off, there was a chip right there in the buoy. Actually, this gear here on my left is also British Columbia gear, and so the managing Division of Fisheries and Oceans are putting these chips, these uh, pit tag kind of chips in the gear that, that we can scan it and we get all the information of where it was set, when was it last hauled, things like that. So in our case, this one um, on the screen, it was set about seven weeks earlier off the northeast corner of Queen Charlotte Island. So lots of information, how many doing a time? Okay, um, so those changes in that gear go well beyond like uh, gear coming from British Columbia versus gear coming from Alaska. It's, um, that's not my timer, is it? I'm not running out of time, am I, Amy? Okay. <laughs> okay. That's why I checked. Okay. Um, someone? But uh, also cables. We're getting gear from uh, cables. Um, I'm going to show you. We actually brought a sample up here, uh, and I'm going to give you that case history. And moorings and anchor gear. Okay. Uh, and fads. Does anyone know what a fad is? Did I put it there? It's right there, isn't it? Fish aggregating device. As fish stocks decrease, fishermen are putting out basically marine debris. They're putting stuff out there that creates an ecosystem then, then, then you know, collects all the small schooling fish, and then those small schooling fish collect the big, the big fish, which then creates an you know, environment for tuna, and that's what their focus is, the sports fish there. Okay. So lots of gear changes. And uh, what I want to do is give you an example of that, because a couple years ago, just right, right off out Maui here, we had a sub-adult humpback whale that was just sitting off the lookout. People on the lookout were looking down at an entangled whale. They called in, we responded, and couldn't see the entanglement from the lookout, but when we put a camera in the water, it looked like braided line hanging from the mouth, okay? Okay, there's a good view, another pole cam footage, okay? Um, I thought it was braided line. I'm obviously using a knife. I thought it's line. I'll cut it. Uh, in that case, we're using them. I'm sure this is going to do justice. Oops. Let me go back. I thought I had a picture here. Yes. Okay. Uh, dual roll. Right there, what I'm doing is wearing a pair of glasses that live feed to a camera on the end of the pole next to the knife. So like a surgeon, like a doctor, you can see the whale and the rope as you go down and make the cut. So we're getting more technologically advanced here. So when, um, when you see that video and you see the miss, I'm not running blind. The whale kind of shied away from me and I ran out of pole. I mean, so I'm, I can see that exact view in real time. But the whale kept going, I don't know, and it kept shifting away. So we didn't get to make the cut. I'm glad we didn't make the cut because we, we never got the whale free that day but we, te we were able to find it again. The next day we worked on it, and it ended up being cable, coaxial cable, communications cable, that no knife was gonna cut. We needed to hit Ace Hardware and get the cable cutters. So, new tool. So that's cable cutters cutting the cable from the whale's mouth, okay? So, and there's the cable in the inflatable, some of it. It took two inflatable loads. Um, it was. So it was, I think it was 850 or 840 feet total of cable that that poor whale was dragging around. So, yep. And that is, by the way, afterwards, there is a piece of that dissected here, because remember, we're trying to figure out what it was, where it came from, things like that. So, uh, anchor chain. So that's what's in the whale's mouth here. This is up in Alaska, by the way. I did sneak in Alaska one here. But there's an anchor chain 
Poor little tour boat, anchors not knowing, uh, whale comes along feeding, gets the anchor chain in the, in the mouth. So they were able to cut the anchor chain and free the whale. So another happy ending. Okay. So lots of mouth entanglements, though. I want to stress there's been an increase, and it fits along with that inflection point of the environmental change. And in short, what we think might be happening here is the whales are feeding differently. They're feeding in different places. They're feeding differently. They're feeding on different food sources because we think part of this environmental shift is that some of the food isn't there. It's diminished or diminished in quality. And humpback whales being generalists, they can adapt pretty well, we think. They're doing okay. You guys are probably seeing the news about the gray whales, the fact that a lot of them are dying because they're, they're thin, they're emaciated. They're more special, specialists, so they're more um, impacted than, say, a humpback whale might be. Okay? So humpbacks feeding near shore, changes in um, some of the gear types there as well because we're looking at the data, and all that's showing is that the difference between, uh, well, gear that's set near shore, it was low in the beginning, well, be before the environmental change, but after the environmental change, the percent of gear that is set near shore in shallow water jumped significantly. I think it's three to four times as many, okay? I think overall, they're gonna learn the ropes. I you know I put another one of my little puns or whatever those are called in there, and I think they do, and, and those spikes will decrease over time. I think it is uh, those changes that get them. And this is a good segue, by the way. That occurred to me, because I'm gonna show you some youngsters getting caught in the gear. And again, I think it's experience. It's experience on the fishing side. It's experience on the whale side. So when you can have and changes that occur that might impact the adults. But the youngsters, they're new. Everything's new to them. So they are more impacted in that regard. So let's show you a calf entangle. We've had uh, a couple of them. Now, when these calves get entangled, it's bad. Um, we definitely prioritize them because they grow into the gear. We've got a, some footage here of a mother nursing its calf. Okay, so the calf is nursing. It just kind of pulls up to the tanker chip, and mother senses the, the calf there and pumps this rich milk to the calf. Almost 50% milk fat. Okay, the calf grows very quickly. And to put that in perspective, vitamin D whole milk is 4% milk fat. Okay, so the calf is growing very quickly. And when it does that, the gear just disappears. Like within two days, it's gone. So our typical knives here are nice hooked knives that are dull on the outside, sharp on the inside, that we grab the line, can't grab it. It bounces past it. So we had to make a special knife. Uh, I don't know if I have it up there yet, but, but there it is on the uh, upper right-hand side. There's the calf. You can see the lines already disappearing. Good news here, it's just pinched in. It's not cutting the calf. At least it hasn't yet for the ones who... So here's the cut. There it is right there. Um, calf got a little curious, got another look at it, got the gear off. It exploded off the calf. It was one of those sets of gear we never covered. Okay. So, and then here's a juvenile with a, also monofilament, but it's a monofilament long line. Okay. And uh, terribly, these, these uh, small gauge strong lines are the worst for the animals. They cut easily into the animal. The larger stuff might be strong, but it acts like its own chafe gear. It can actually protect the whale a little bit. Okay. So not good. Here's a case where the whale was actually pretty cooperative, had a good helms person. So we're staying on the big boat. It's a little rough. And the helms person is able to get me close enough to the whale to start trimming off all those wraps off behind the whale on the tail. Here, I almost bit off two more than I could chew there, though. So we got, yep. So we got a lot on that one. And then we just kept doing that. I'm not going to be able to show you every clip, but we kept doing that until all the wraps were off. Okay. And so here, the data, I want to show you data again. Um, it's, it's a lot of juveniles and the calves, especially the juveniles, that get, are getting entangled. That's, that percentage you're looking at there is much higher than the population. Okay. So that piece of the pie for this calves, the calves and the juveniles are much higher overall. It's the youngsters getting it caught in the gear. Okay. Same thing would hold in Alaska or elsewhere, by the way. And since I showed you that picture of that whale, I wanted to show you a case, pole cam footage, where it's, that's a flipper of a whale, and it's lifted out of the water. So, yes, we don't think they know you're there to help. You know, we know that we they know they're where to help them. But this is a case where when we pulled up the whale, went, "Ooh, what are you doing?" Maybe, maybe it was looking at us, or maybe it said, "There's the flipper. If that's what you want, get that off." But it did it, and we took advantage of it and made the cuts to get that off. So that's what you're seeing on that particular clip of a youngster off of Wahoo. Okay. Now, I know that was kind of fast, 
but I also wanted to give you the accomplishments because, again, big team effort. We've mounted more than 180 responses. Um, we've gotten gear off 32 whales, but I'd like to say 29 of those I feel good about. I think in 29 cases, we made a difference. I think the animal has a, a very good chance of surviving. In some cases, we know. We track them through photo ID, be able to know that they did survive. Okay? Um, most of them humpback whales. There was one say whale, by the way. About a 43% success rate. That's pretty good. More than 12,000 feet of measurable line. There's some of that monofilament line and some of the netting we don't measure out, you know, but, but um, well over 12,000 feet. And more than 70 sets of gear identified. Remember, that's the, that's the information gaining message of trying to figure out what this gear is, where it's from, what it is, how was it set, things like that. Okay. This past season, kind of an average season in the, in the reporting, uh, nine confirmed cases, nine different animals that we know of, large whales. Seven of them were adults, two of sub-adults. By the way, most years, it was mostly sub-adults. I already told you, a lot of youngsters getting tangled. But recently, with that environmental change, another big change, mostly adults coming down. We think the youngsters not getting as much food don't come down maybe as much as they used to. Only the adults with a big full fuel tank can make it down to Hawaii. You know, 2,000 miles, and there's no rest areas. So... Yep. Five disentanglement efforts, got two of them with both partials. We never got either of those cases totally free, but in one case we got significant amounts off, and that's uh, this gear right here. So this is some of the gear off of one of the ones this year. Uh, it was over 400 feet, so that's only like maybe 200 feet or 150 feet of that gear, so that really gives it, put things in perspective. And uh, the two cases that we were involved, that we knew what the gear was. One of them was from British Columbia, and the other one was from uh, the Aleutians up in Alaska. Okay. And again, team effort. This is, you know, I end up being the, in, well, I'm a coordinator, as you heard, uh, yep, uh, but also um, just well, a member of the team, a spokesperson in that regard. Big team effort. And uh, what is it, a success? Well, getting potentially all the lethal gear off the animal, minimal injuries to the animal. Uh, no injuries to the humans. You know, we don't want to have another Joe in Howlett incident. And then gaining the information. That's key here. Okay. And uh, people are always asking how you can help. Some of these are generalizations. But yeah, there's things like, you know, just don't put things in the ocean that don't need to be there. Get them out. Things like with fishing, don't wet store. Some fishermen want to keep their gear in there in the off season. No, you got to get it out of there. And then when you have it in there, let's see if we can make it more whale safe. I know it's kind of a catchphrase, but there are things we can do to change, and change the dynamics there and, and reduce the threat. Things like less scope in the water or use sinking line, weak links. I brought some of the things. Um, pingers, noise alerts to let the whales know the gear is there. Not so loud to deter them, just let them know the gear is there. So some examples. Prevention is big. Okay. And there's the hotline number, because that's one thing we all do in it. And again, the Aloha Spirit here in Hawaii is amazing. The community has really come together, worked together, Everything from the reporting and standing by and getting us the initial documentation assessment, you know, helping transport the team, all that kind of stuff is really cool. Um, it's amazing, in fact. So there's a report form, and again, the hotline number there is key. That's under no fisheries. And I mentioned pictures and location, which way it's heading, things like that. Likely to be mobile. And then acknowledgments. Again, I want to acknowledge that team. And you can't acknowledge every organization or company or individual kind of had to group people up and put them in the categories, but pretty much it's everyone here. It really is. So again, it's pretty amazing. And thank you guys, mahalo. And I'm not sure how close I do. But thank you. And you said at the start that uh, one of the goals was to make changes so less tangles. Right. In your 20 years or more of doing this, what changes maybe have? Have happened? A lot of them have happened on the East Coast where, remember those right whales, those North Atlantic right whales, made it that much more critical. Okay, so, and they've been, the, it's an epicenter in many ways for this type of effort. Again, with the right whales driving it, the history is another advantage of giving the history between Newfoundland and New England. That's where things started for the most part, even globally. So some of the examples have been, like I worked on one, um, I actually, another little historical note here, and it's a good one because it'll fit, is I got to a point where 
um, there was too much focus on save the whale, and I quit. And I started working with fishermen to make their gear more whale safe. I tagged their gear to learn the dynamics of the gear. Fishermen thought, I can zip my gear along the ocean floor. When it's going off the boat, the traps, they thought they were so good they could lay the traps down, and they used floating line between the traps. They said, well, we can get that down. It's not going to be floating in the water column to catch a whale. We're zipping it down. They actually, the harder they pulled what was happening, because they tagged the gear, is the pots were bouncing back and creating bigger loops. Okay? So those loops were very dangerous, and a lot of uh, fishermen will use what's called trawls or long line of traps. So you might have 20 traps, each one with a loop of line up in the water column. Okay? If you can use sinking line between those traps, you will reduce the amount of gear in the water column in New England, based on the lobster fishermen, lobster fishery and crab fishery, by 40%. And that is significant. That's a big one. Now, the name of the game here is going to be 5% here, 10% there, and try to bring the, you know, reduce the threat overall. But sinking line, um, did I bring it? I thought I had a weak link here. I guess I didn't have it. But uh, there's little weak links, uh, tricks to, to reduce knots. So there's like the buoy itself, the marking system at the surface, is, oh, there's a weak link. Thanks, Kate. Okay, so here's a little weak link that fishermen might buy, and, and it can, has a breakaway and makes a bitter end that can go through a whale's mouth and, and avoid the knot. Okay, you might put this up near the buoy so the buoy's gone, and, and again, a bitter, clean end to go through a whale's mouth or, or go through a whale's tail and not get caught. So things to reduce the threat. Um, oh, boy. And the pingers are a good one, too. But the, here's, the, here's the thing. In each of those, there's the positive and then there's the negative. Nothing's ever easy. So some of these things you might say would cause more in the marine debris problems. A storm comes along and those weak links break pre prematurely and you've just created marine debris. The pingers, maybe seals and sea lions hear this and go, oh, dinner bell, I've learned that this means a net with, with food in it and they depredate off the fishermen. So nothing is simple, that's the problem here. So some good examples, that help you? Yes, so the question being is, have we looked into developing lines that might be breakdown in UV? Yes, breakdown in, believe it or not, uh, if it, it, it comes in contact with the, the uh, dermal layer, the, the fat tissue, okay? So if it got embedded, there was even looking into making lines that would degrade when it come, came in contact. And you know what happens here is there is, those would work, but a lot of times the, the cost value is too high, yes, and money is big here. Okay, because you know, to be fair, fishermen only have too much, and I'm generalizing, remember it's not always fishing gear, but fishermen only have so much money in their pocket, and they're the ones spending the money to do it, and they will. Uh, so those didn't fly. It has to be, and it has to be, again, prudent, cost effective. These are some of the you know, characterizations there uh, for it to work, uh, and we haven't solved those. It, generally speaking, it hasn't. But now what they're looking for in New England, and again, that epicenter of effort, is they're looking at making the lines weaker. See, lines have gotten stronger over time and, and cheaper, and especially the floating line. Lines sold by the weight, you know, not the length. So a floating line that's super strong that lasts six or seven years is much better for a fisherman. And, but if we can make a sinking line that is maybe a couple thousand pounds weaker that's within the range that a whale might break if it had to um, and still last five or six years, that's a winner. So, and that's what they're trying to do. And, I, and I've helped with that as well. Yep. So. Oh, yeah, right in the center. Uh, okay, so uh, just in case everyone couldn't hear, but how long did it take me and, and probably others we can bring into the fold here to make the cuts without cutting the whale? Well, you know, I, could sh I cherry picked the videos, by the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there, are, there is the blooper reel. Okay. If you, okay. And really, the danger is not to the animal, okay? Um, the danger is more to the, to the humans out there, because what if there's a response? You know, it's probably like shaving, right? If you nick the whale, it's like, ooh, ouch, you know, maybe, at most. Um, so big animal again. But, you know, we do pretty well, and we do practice. We do train. And it's all, I call it, the angle of attack. You, you want to hold the blade. Let's show you. Yeah, you don't want to come across like this. You want to have an angle like that. You want that 45-degree angle. That's more likely to slide along, get to where you need to get, get underneath that line. Much better. And of course, there's angle of attack with the, how the pole is held, too. So, so we practice a lot. We've actually built a little tail 
kind of as big as we could get, big as a piece of plywood, right? Um, our juvenile. And we tow it behind a boat and we pull up and make cuts on that practice whale. So, and the team is really, well, uh, puts, puts a lot of time into it. So, yep. Or I'll go back and I'll come up afterwards. So I noticed you weren't harnessed in at all on the boat. Mm -hmm. I was like, why isn't he wearing a harness or something? You ever got pulled in? Or yeah, we, we haven't got pulled in. Uh, you know, uh, we like to keep things simple. And I'm not a big fan of the harness, but I don't want to get pulled in either. And here's what we've done. We've, we've, pra we've actually practiced a little bit like, what if that happens? And, and we figured out that you're not going to cut yourself free. I mean, if, if you're towed behind, you got pulled over somehow and you got a, a loop around your arm or something like that, we didn't bring it, but there's a safety knife you carry and you keep it on your person. It's a one-handed knife. You can cut yourself free, okay? But it isn't going to happen. In reality, the panic of that situation of being all of a sudden pulled overboard, what we've got is a support boat. You know, here's the inflatable behind the whale. There is a support boat right here on your quarter and on the bow of that support boat, we have another person, good arm, with a cutting grapple. And we practice for this. We do little practices where we, we see how fast that boat can come in, throw that grapple, and break the link between the whale and the person, the whale and the inflatable. And we believe that's our best scenario solution to a what-if situation. Uh, and so far, it hasn't happened, but you gotta be, you, you're, he's right. We've got to be careful and be aware of the risks here. Yeah. Yep. What's the danger in Hawaii of ghost nets or the long nets that the big fishing boats are putting out? So, uh, the risks of ghost nets out there, they're real. Um, we've, um, let's see if I can remember the numbers. I think there's like 11 cases where we know the gear was marine debris or ghost gear, um, almost certainly. You know, for instance, one, one case, there was 22 different types of gear on the whale. So that's not one set, not two sets. It was a hodgepodge of things. And it, so it probably was marine debris, ghost gear that the whale picked up probably on its migration, maybe across the North Pacific uh, garbage patch, that kind of thing. It's amazing you don't get more of those. Um, and we do, in the case that we do, it does happen. It's usually juveniles. And we think they play with the gear. I know when I first started working with fishermen, the fishermen were, Ed, they play with my gear. They, they, they use it as a scratching post, and they, they play with the buoy. And I'm like, oh, come on, guys. It's true. They pl I've seen whales play with gear. They will do it. So, so maybe that's part of it. And it can be natural. They play with kelp, but kelp breaks. Rope doesn't. Yeah. Are they putting out long nets now in the oh, area? It's, it's legal in the sense that, you know, of course, nothing in the U.S. is, well, let me be careful here, in the sense of, of pelagic um, drift gill net. That is illegal for us, okay? Um, but there is the long lines. Uh, they're out there for, they're usually a convergence zone, a couple hundred, well, 800 miles north of us, north of the islands, a more productive area. So there are those long lines out there. And we, we do get reports of those animals getting caught up there in the long lines and, of course, getting them down here. Remember, we, it may happen, and no one may know until weeks, months, years later when someone finally finds the whale and uh, reports it. So there's, that again, that disconnect in time and space. Or maybe we get lucky and the whale throws it on its own and leaves the scars behind. Yeah. Yep. Are there any technologies that you're aware of that you like to hmm. You know, there's, of course, the drone was sort of new. I mean, kind of. But I've been investigating that for years now. There's the ROVs, too. There, I mean, ROVs first were like you had to have the cable. I was like, gosh, I don't want to use a cable because that's just more entanglement risk. What if there goes the ROV on the back of the whale? Um, and they're too slow. But now ROVs can go to a short tether to a buoy with a transmitter back, and the things will do like eight knots. So you could like maybe ride up next to the whale with a camera aiming at it, get a, get a picture of all the entanglement, run the ROV back to the boat, haul it aboard, everyone get into their iPad you know, in the cabin, game plan, action plan, and cut the whale free. Because it's really about getting everyone's heads together and figuring out how to cut the animal free. So there's one example. Um, yeah, it's, it's for us, we're, fo I mean, we're focusing on the knives and the, and the photography to gain the information. Yep. And taking advantage of Hawaii's clear waters. We're in a good situation. We have those clear, everyone's jealous about, of us in other, other areas because they look at our imagery. And, but that's, we're gaining a lot of information. And 
those 2,000 miles from some of the source is acting like a filter. It's a natural filter. So we have this really a good lab and good Aloha spirit. You put it all together, and we've got the team, and we're, it's working out well. Oh, yeah. Amy. So I'm really interested in how you're learning about where the gear is coming from, that little quarter-sized microchip or whatever it yeah. was. Uh, it's awesome technology. Is that the same brand? It was, no, it was a British Columbia. Yeah, and then, so it, only the West Coast was doing it, only the West Coast fisheries. And I, it may be just the crab industry. Okay. Um, so, so this buoy here has, well, it was the first time that I found the chip. So we've been taking British Columbia gear off the whales down here. This is British Columbia gear. And they keep saying, look for the slot on the top of the buoy, and the chip will be in there. And I kept looking, and I kept, I even dissected one buoy all up. This was the first time that there was actually a chip. And what's happening is these whales are taking these things you know, they're not meant to be pulled underwater, right? The chip survives, but the buoys don't. They get crushed and they expand, crush and expand, and it causes the slot to get so big that the chip falls out and floats away or disappears. So, so for this time, I got lucky, or we got lucky. That's awesome. Yeah. I saw, I'm from New England, and I saw uh, episode Northwoods Law, where they follow the game wardens, and they were checking lobster pots up yep. there. And they pulled one up, and they were checking for whale entanglement, tracking things on there, like red zip ties oh. and things like that. Yep. And so that would, I guess that would crush and expand. Those would survive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we were, yeah. There's all kinds of things you can do, and those are great. I know when I was in New England, we would do things like that to make sure the gear was current. So we'd say, the next three months, everyone's got to put a, two red zip ties at this location. And if they didn't, if the gear didn't have their two red zip ties in that period of time, we considered ghost gear, and we hauled it. And fishermen had to buy it back, you know, so they didn't mark their gear. But that let us know it wasn't ghost gear, or they weren't wet storing. They weren't just leaving it there for the next season, you know, unbaited, but still a threat to, the, to all marine life. So little things like that, again, make a difference. It's, it's 5%, you know, here, 2% there. Yep. 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 Exactly. These chips are amazing because they're using the, the, a lot of the fishermen, the technology they have on board their boats is amazing. So when the fisherman hauls the pot, they pull up and they reach over, they grab the buoy, and they put it over their pot hauler, like a, a wheel that pinches a line, and they haul it aboard. It's, once it's on board, there is a scanner that picks it up and logs it in that goes to their echo sounder, which might be linked some uh, cellular data that goes to shore to the managers. So the managers log that in right away and know when the fisherman has hauled his or her gear. And so that's how we got the information. So it's all automatic kind of thing in that regard. No more calling it in, writing down pieces of paper, log sheets, sending them in afterwards. So it's technology with the fishermen nowadays. Yep. Yep. Right. In the middle. So how are you uh, leading this information? Well, let's see. Oh, the question being is how does this relate back or sharing information back with the fishermen and getting them part of the team, maybe. There you go. Exactly. Because we want, we want the fishermen to come to the table. We don't want to alienate them. Um, they have to be part of the solution. They might be part of the problem, no doubt, but they have to be part of the solution. The ghost gear uh, retrieval, a lot of times, that's a good example, uh, they'll be hired. Usually it's a fishing boat that's hired to work with you and go out and collect the gear. So you're, you're giving back to the fishermen and, and involving them. They become part of the team to go out there and collect maybe their buddy's gear. Uh, I know one case where I was on the boat where the guy collected it and goes, oh, I know what happened here. The guy ha had a death in the family, you know, and he just, it just absorbed him. You know, he didn't go out. He just left everything because of the death in the family. So things like that, we do know that that occurs. Um, you know, on the, on the whale safe stuff, gear prevention kind of things, they're part of the effort. I know some fishermen in New England came up with an idea, you know the Chinese finger? Uh, you know, you put, you put your fingers in there, and they, they design where they can use older gear and splice it using Chinese fingers, essentially similar to it, and it made a weak link. So the whale could break that, but it, yet it quickly spliced their gear together and allowed them to use older gear as well. So things like that, let's see. Well, I'd probably come up with more, but they're definitely part of the solution, if you will. Yep, in many, many ways. Yep. People ask, like, why don't you tag that whale? Why don't, you know the tag you use to get back to the whale to cut it free? The one that's attached to the gear? 
once the whale's free, there's no more gear on it, we have no means of attaching that one to the whale. Um, and there are tags, you know, well, we, we have suction cup tags at the sanctuary, but those are only going to last for a day or two. The ones that are going to help us keep track of the whale in the long term, you have to shoot into the whale. And we're very shy of, you know, for something like that, the whale is, it is going to be compromised. It's going to be thin. It's already gone through a lot. We don't want to go that direction. So we've basically relied on the photo ID, a very benign technique. You know, remember, oh, maybe don't remember. <laughs> maybe everyone doesn't know. But for a humpback whale, when they lift that tail up, the underside of the tail is differentially pigmented, black and white. That tail or fluke is 15 feet across, a p pretty big fingerprint. And that's what we've done. So when we've cut the whale free, we've tried to get the fingerprint, the fluke ID, and then we send that out to the, as broadly as we can. All the researchers here, all the researchers in Alaska, you know, places where we're likely to get a recite. And sometimes we get lucky. Now there is the digital fluke ID catalogs coming online now, another example of technology where they're using computer algorithms to do the matching. No more uh, interns looking at two computer screens going, <laughs> you know, okay? And so that is amazing technology that is gonna allow us to track our whales even better. One of the examples is happy whale. And so we're sending our whole, we send every entangled whale to them and we send all our unentangled whales to them as well, hoping everyone else does the same thing. And that's our, probably our best bet. And don't have to shoot anything into the whale. I'm getting a little bit off, off topic here, but you led into it with uh, the identification of whales. We know that there's fewer whales. We've been counting fewer whales here in, in, in Maui for the last couple of years. Do you have any comments on why or, or any, you know, ideas? Gotcha. Well, and, and again, we've got to be careful here. Um, we, we can say we're getting fewer sightings, okay, because we don't know whether the population decreased or did they just not come to the areas that we're looking for, I mean, around coastal Hawaii? Because you could even take it to a level, maybe they came, but maybe they didn't come into where the effort is, where we look, you know, tour boats or re whale researchers. Uh, so we are checking into that, by the way. Uh, and Dr. Mark Lammers would be a key person at the sanctuary. He's looking at the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, along with others, to see maybe they're going somewhere else. But I think, in general, the main theory or hypothesis that most researchers have, so it's not just me, Okay, um, from Hawaii and, and abroad, we'll say the food resource change. Well, environmental changes occurred. Like I, I gave you a little sneak preview of the blob and El Nino and, and the North, uh, decadal, see, North Pacific decadal oscillation. Okay, and those environmental changes can affect food. Okay, and they, they do affect food. I mean, it's not just humpback whales, but you, you guys have probably seen the news, like the the MERS, the birds, the seabirds have had big die-offs and and salmon is not coming back as well. And, and it's just all these uh, chain reaction of, of food, uh, the bottom of the food chain is impacted and affects the, the food chain up above. And so we think, if you run with, my, run with the hypothesis, that if they're not feeding as well, if food wasn't as easy, even if you're a generalist like a humpback whale, maybe you don't come to Hawaii, maybe you skip a year or two. So what used to be at 2.3 or 2.5, uh, breeding cycle for a female maybe becomes three and a half, four on average. Okay, they skip some years because they're going, boy, did not get enough food, you know, and I got to wait another year to build up enough reserves to give birth to a 12 foot, you know, calf that's half a ton, and you get the idea. So does that answer it? I mean, because I'm, I'm broad brushstroke there. But that's, that's it. We're thinking environmental change. Uh, and then, again, environmental change could be cyclical uh, or it could be, boy, the whole. Cl uh, global, you know, climate change and things like that. So we don't know. Yeah. Yep. Oh, the blob. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a, was a higher latitude. El Ninos are low latitude, generally speaking, right? A warm water cell, mostly typically more eastern based. Um, okay. But the blob was very central North Pacific, but high latitude. You know, you're in the. 40s and 50s and 60s on the latitude, uh, but in the North Pacific. And it's something relatively new. Uh, and it really wreaked havoc because it's in the productive area of the ocean, not the tropics, but the temperate area and, and beyond, subarctic. And these were the productive areas. So you saw these big repercussions of, 
again, the, the mer like seabird die-offs and stellar sea lions being impacted and whales being impacted. So it, more impact in that regard, generally speaking. Okay, thank you.